Zach Clayton. Does that name say anything to you? Does it mean anything? Zach Clayton didn't participate in the in the Yom Kippur War, but a year later, he was the referee in between George Foreman and Muhammad Ali in that boxing match. We're not going to have a boxing match here because there are two people participating, both of them extremely distinguished, both of them major generals in reserves who contributed together and separately to the security of the State of Israel, and each will give their version in reply to various questions. The head of the intelligence during the Yom Kippur War, that's Major General Tzvi Zamir, sorry, um, Major General Eli Zaira, and the head of the Mossad, Major General Tzvi Zamir. Eli? Eli Zaira, in the audience, there are many who would want to accuse you, but I think you're probably going to be able to say mea culpa or whatever much better. Please, could you tell us about that week and that period just before the outbreak of the war in October 73? I have a request. Since I want to devote four minutes to my list of mistakes, and I'm not sure that it will suffice, therefore I will give you the responsibility for four minutes before I conclude for you to come and stop me. The things I would like to talk about are the following. That's first of all the birth of the conceptia, of the concept, the whole issue of low probability. Three, my work with politicians. And five, the absurd theater. And then, if I have time, three marginal, marginal, um, comments, and I think you all know what it means when I say that they're just marginal concepts. Now, the birth of this concept. During two and a half years, I wandered through the corridors of the Pentagon as a kind of uh, lobbyist for the State of Israel and uh, the IDF until they said to me, come, we want you to head the intelligence in Israel. So the moment I did, I immediately went down to the Suez Canal. And there I met with the Intel people, and they said to me the following. Egypt has a million people in their ranks of the army, and on the canal they have over 100,000, 880,000 cannons, plus the most cutting-edge aerial defense system above it. And I said, and what on our side? Well, on your side, there are 120 kilometers and about 12 positions. And how many people? They said a thousand. In other words, a thousand against a hundred thousand. And they've got about 80 as opposed to their at least 800, if not more. All that did not appeal to me. And I decided to ask them, but what happens if at a night when there are about 10 kilometers between one outpost and another, a thousand Egyptians will get into boats and cross? Well, unfortunately, even if a 5,000 cross, we won't know. But in the morning, we'll know. How will you know? Because we have patrols in the morning. And what will happen in the morning? The morning, the armored tanks will come along. The armored corps will come along. And they'll get rid of them. So that's that answer. I didn't want to argue with these youngsters, these soldiers. Because as a veteran, as an elderly man in those days, because I remembered the War of Independence, 
And then I remembered that we had a myriad of difficulties when the Arab um, Falachim went and entrenched themselves. I don't know if there are any people from the Palmach or Givati. They probably remember how those the Arabs used to entrench themselves. So I really was not happy after that visit to the Suez Canal. And I decided I would speak that night to another major general, who at that time I thought, and I still think, at that time he was the most wise and intelligent and savvy um, major general of the, in those days. He's the, he was a deputy of the chief of staff. So I said to him, this whole defense of Sinai along the Suez Canal does not appeal to me. And you know that thousands could cross it in the middle of the night from the Egyptian side because the distance is only 300 meters from one side to another. So what will we then do? You're the deputy, you know, to the chief of staff. You're the head of uh, operations. And he said to me, don't worry. We have in intel, reliable intel, that their intention is not to cross it, but rather to reach the Straits, which is about 50 kilometers. And we are preparing them a battlefield of killing between that um, and the actual crossing part, part, part near the Straits. And I said, how do you know that? Well, first of all, we have documents and we have, we've been listening in and we are certain that it's correct. But on the way out of his of his bureau, I said to myself, but the whole issue of the defense of the canal does not appeal to me. I don't like it, but I won't. I will talk about it another time. I don't want to go on about it now. So I then rang up those really the wise, you know, RLA had a fantastic assessment system, and I'm not saying it cynically whatsoever. And I said, tomorrow we're meeting, explain to me where, d d does the intel derive from that the plan of the Egyptians is to reach the Straits? So I met the following day, they showed me the documents, the plans, and the Egyptians' war plan as well. And one, by the way, did not depend on the other. They were from different sources based on different data. And thus, on, in the first 24 hours that I was the head of Intel, I understood what the conceptia was, as we called it, the concept was, that the Egyptians want to reach the canal, at least the canal, and that's the someone has corrected him, until the, up to the Straits, and this is their program, and that we believe. Yes, I must admit that I also believed it, although I didn't like the defense of the canal, but I believed them, and I'd like to explain what the concept was. And it wasn't someone's imagination, it wasn't a figment of someone's imagination. And Yossi, you promised to behave nicely, excuse me. No interpolations whatsoever. This is no, not a field court-martial. I think that the gentleman from the audience said it's the first time he's heard this. But it wasn't said into a microphone. And for those polite people who doubt what I'm saying, I'll explain. The concept was comprised of a document and chapeau to that document that was brought by the Mossad. And that was a, form, that was a conversation between Brezhnev and Anwar Sadat, wherein Sadat says that I want to conquer Sinai, at least up to the Straits, and I can't move between the, the Sinai and the Straits um, without some kind of aerial defense, so please could you supply this aerial defense? And that was one of the documents. Other documents showed us what the Egyptian program was, and that was to cross the canal and reach the Straits, the Tehran Straits. That was the concept. My second topic 
was the death of the low probability. Low probability was actually a subsidiary, was a derivative of that concept that had been formulated. The night between Wednesday and Thursday, don't forget that the wars, uh, the outbreak was on the Saturday, so this was between Wednesday and Thursday nights. This was, I believe, the great, was the greatest achievement of one of our Intel units, which is 8200. They achieved knowledge that the Americans with their satellites or the, Brit the British sitting on the hills in Cyprus knew, and that was that the Russians Russian, were rushing to, to va va evacuate all their scientists from Syria to the USSR. So we're talking about midnight. And I immediately call upon the chief of staff and the, and the minister of defense. And he says to me, tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, you're in my bureau. We're going to discuss this. Now, this is now Friday, 26 hours before the war. Listen, etiquette is demanded here. Please calm down and listen. Okay, I'm, I can see that I, this is being advertised now. Okay, indeed. It's now Friday, 9 a.m., and at this meeting, there are three chief of staffs, Tsvitsul, Moshe Dayan, and Dado. And I say to them, the, the Russians are evacuating their families. I don't know why, but I will give you a premise. The, the Russians think that a war is going to break out. So if, so if they think, then the, the, the two possibilities that we're going to start or that the Arabs are going to start, had they thought that it's us, then, then we would have heard it from the Americans. This is So at the same time, the two chief of staffs, I mean, retired chief of staffs, Tsvitsu and Moshe Dayan, and it's quite bizarre because it's nearly simultaneously. They both come to the same conclusion and they say, according to our opinion, the Egyptians are going to attack and we believe that they want to do it. It should be a surprise attack. And I, Moshe Dayan, I'm going to prepare a transmission for the United States to Kissinger and I will say the following. Number one, that we are not going to attack and two, we know that they are going to attack. And three, that they want to do it, they want to carry out a surprise attack. And four, that we're going to be ready for their surprise. And that is on Friday, 9.15, 26 hours before the war breaks out. The second thing that happens and I have no explanation why, is the Chief of Staff and the Minister of Defense, maybe through an intu a sense of intuition, they decided that the war would break out on Yom Kippur the following day. And the discussion that starts between Dado and Moshe Dayan is not whether there will be, if, but rather how do we mobilize our forces? How can we do it? There's no radio. So perhaps we'll ask Galei Tzahal and um, Kol Israel, maybe they should transmit psalms or something. So the discussion between the two of them was not whether if there's going to be a war, but there is going to be a war, but it's going to take place the following day on Shabbat. Dayan.
before I move over to what Diane said, and for those who do not relate to the facts exactly, I would like to read out from the minutes two things. In brief, yes, definitely in brief. First, Diane says at that same morning that any surprise element that is that the Arabs think will believe in will think that it does not exist. The second thing that he says to us, it's from the minutes, I'm reading it out to you. There's no controversy vis-a-vis -vis this issue unless you want to come and say that this has been falsified and people say that as well nowadays. And we're talking about nine o'clock in the morning Friday. What we saw beforehand as less reasonable with low probability, we now see in higher probability. And we see that their assault preparations um, may just be a drill in Egypt in order to cover up for something. But it might be a drill. That's from Dayan. Moshe Dayan was calling him, he said. By the way, and that's interesting per se, we know, we know what Dayan said, we know what Dayan wrote, but we don't know what Dayan thought. But here I would like to read out something to you about his thoughts, because he did sort of... Um, come out with them, like sometimes you hear in, in Shakespeare, you know, asides in Shakespearean plays. If we don't have a policy wherein it says, please let them come in, let them come up onto that, it's a shame to spoil it, everything, they'll come and we'll treat them. So actually, Normatively, that's something that we ought to do, but all this at the moment is actually not worthwhile for us. In other words, normally one shouldn't do anything. Let them come in and we'll beat them, we'll give them a decisive blow. But at the moment, it's not worthwhile for them to do it. Why not? Because uh, perhaps it was a month before the elections, but I've no proof of that. Diane was so certain that there was going to be a war that he first and foremost asks for a meeting with the Prime Minister Golda Meir. And as usual, if you remember, wherever he went, Arya Brown went with him. And Arya Brown said exactly what always used to happen. And he said, a Syrian Egyptian attack would be of higher would be of higher probability. We have to be prepared for a war that's going to break out on Yom Kippur. And any element of surprise that they believe, they have to understand that there, it does not exist. And the probability, and he quoted, that we have knowledge that the probability is higher and that is something which means that there is an intention to 100% cross the Suez Canal. And that is what he said on Friday morning to Golda Meir. After that, Diane invited Dado and myself to the government, to the parliament actually, to the government meeting. Now, who are the five participants? Dado, Diane, Tsul, Balev, and I bring Galili with me because during the Haganah, he was a chief of staff as well. By the way, the quotation beforehand was from Moshe Dayan's aide de camp, Brown. It was a quotation from it. At that meeting, and I won't go into the nitty-gritty because I haven't got time, but at that meeting, there's a deliberation about the war, not whether there's going to be a war, but about a war that is breaking out the following day. And what does Israel Galili say? 
that since tomorrow a war could break out, I propose that now the government should decide that it is giving Diane and Golda Meir a full power of attorney basically to run, manage the war, to run it. In other words, we talk about two meetings on the Friday morning wherein there isn't any more low probability unless someone then says that um, the, the chief of intelligence is Diane and Golda's commander, but rather Diane and Golda say that there's high probability, the timing is tomorrow, and Galili says now we have to decide that Galili and Golda have all the authority to run the war that will break out tomorrow. What does not happen in opposition to the whole concept of security, they do not recruit reserves. And that, till this very day, has remained some kind of a sort of quiz in our eyes, some kind of riddle. That, by the way, I'm going to continue. I want more time because of all these interpolations. The question was, and I don't have an answer, I have various kind of premises that I've sort of, but in opposition, in contrast to the security concept, they did not mobilize the reserves, although in the government and the Diane said that it is no longer low probability of a war and that the war will break out tomorrow. This is not a question and answer session, please. I'm first of all going to talk about my mistakes. And then, if you allow me, I will talk about my various sort of side marginal comments, which are also important. And one of them is for Mr. Rangovsky. No, there's time. Carry on. is the person who's actually making the comments from the audience. I always called you Yossi. Okay. I'm going to start with a list of my mistakes. My mistakes. Can everyone hear? Okay. My first mistake was that I didn't invite Chaim Gori to join are assessors, the intel assessors. Now, you may ask why Chaim Guri. That's, there's a reason why I'm saying it to this distinguished audience. Chaim Guri as kind of an allegory. Because what we had, we had. What didn't we have? We didn't have a mechanism with which we could learn and understand the soul of the Egyptian people and their mindset, and it's very possible that had we and the church people understood their mindset and their souls of the Egyptian people, then we could have understood that it wasn't really Sinai and the Bedouins and the desert understand, really interest them. They've got ha ha grass as well, hash, but it was something totally different. The problem was, their problem was, their shame, their humiliation, that two and a half million Jews that arrived from Europe within five and a half days had actually defeated their glorious army and now there they are sitting on the sides of the Suez Canal with their toes in the water. And that insult, that affront to their honor, had I understood it, I would have understood that they're not trying to get to the Mitle Pass, but they wanted some kind of victory over us, even if it was a minor victory that they could then turn into a bigger one. And over time, I then listened to... And while Sadat's speech, when he was dressed as a field marshal, saying that we have removed the shame 
of uh, 500 years from us. We have removed that after this war. In other words, he was adding the Napoleonic War and the Turkish and the British, and they, he put them all into the same pot with the Israelis of the Six-Day War. In other words, that, that shame and the humiliation that, that was so in literature, we did not actually have. We did not understand. And now I'm speaking to the generation of Intel of nowadays that have amazing technicians who analyze and decipher aerial photographs much more so than it was in our day. But I'm talking to you. In the intelligence, you have to learn literature so that you can understand, truly fathom the souls and the mindsets of our enemy those that we are fighting against. And the second mistake was a little note that was in my pocket. I usually have a, notes in my pocket, and there were just usually two words, five letters, and a question mark. That's what was written on that note. And on that little note, it said, and if not, in Hebrew, it's different amount of letters. And I know that many people from the research, research institutes didn't like me because I used to always say, and if not, they'd go back to their offices and their research institutes and they'd say, Elisa Ira doesn't believe me. But where did I fail? Where was my mistake with the, and if not? It was vis-a-vis -vis the concept. I didn't use that little note that said on it, and if not. And that was my mistake. That was my second mistake. The third mistake is connected to something extremely important. And I'll tell you what this third mistake was. I I didn't fight for my opinion enough that we ought to leave the entire area from the, gu from the actual Suez Canal to the, to the actual hills and r only create a strategic defense line on the hills. And so I'm going to now, I'm going to use a rather strong word and say it was not clever to sit along the Suez Canal when there are a hundred thousand on one side and only a thousand on the other side. And it's only such a short distance. You can sit with smaller forces against larger forces. We've learned that from the Greeks and the Spartans. They sat with 300, and they managed to contain, at Thermopylae, they, they actually they managed to contain the army. But it wasn't 120 kilometers then. So one needed to sit on the hills, on the mountains, with lots of minefields and with forces, and then look down as if in the palm of your hand onto the Egyptian force, and not to sit as we were sitting there. That, in my opinion, was what we should have done. And of course, there I had a stake in all that because as the director of intelligence, one needs to always to aspire to a warning space that would give us. Because, for example, I was at the time I was I was taught that you should always have some kind of space to maneuver should be some kind of warning space to maneuver in so for example and you know it it he actually always I was always told where he was anxious for example in Jerusalem it was for example only 30 meters in Jerusalem that's already the space that I have to maneuver in no more than that and no less that's what I need and I didn't have that space there and now I'd like another minute to talk about the theater of absurd now, why did we go out on the Six-Day War? Because the Egyptians invaded that 
warnings, man maneuvering space of ours, because instead of the 300 kilometers, it suddenly became 30 kilometers. It was suddenly cut back. And um, the Egyptian squadron came into Bilgafkafa, so we recruited and mobilized the entire uh, the entire country. They've actually invaded our that alert that sort of warning space, and we we expelled them from there, all the way down to the to the actual canal. And then what happened after that? We turned. Uh, from 300 kilometers, that space, that warning space, we actually somehow turned it into a 300 space. Instead of that 300 meter space, suddenly 300 was all that was left for us as an alert area, warning area. So we wanted it to be at least 50 kilometers. That's what I should have done as the head of intelligence from a professional point of view, as my expertise. I should have demanded that there should be a 50 kilometers one, but the politician said, forget it. The, the, sorry, the, my people around me said, forget it. The politicians will tell you to forget it because they're not going to allow you to move backwards. And don't forget that there was a directive that Dayan gave, and he said, plan conquering, occupying the oil fields of Egypt. And I don't mind you even getting all the way to the Nile. I don't object to you reaching the Nile. And all that understanding that I did not actually fathom at the time, because I couldn't understand what the politicians were saying, but later on I learned it from Uri Neyman and someone else from the Mossad, who showed me exactly, and they said, read these sentences and see what they're saying and what they said, and then you'll understand what they're saying, what was written between the lines and what was being said. And what do I mean? Dado once said in April, I want you to give me an opportunity to screw them so that there won't be a war for 10 years, and let me take advantage of every single incident. And Galili said, very interesting, please explain what you're saying. And Golda was very frightened about people talking about these operative um, plans in front of strangers like me, for example. And that is what you say in the theater, the curtain drop. And then, then uh, Diane said to Golda, yes, I always suspected you. So I didn't realize, but two people from the Mossad and others who were who, Rami Tal, who used to write the speeches for politicians, they taught me how to look at what politicians say. And I, I was naive. I didn't quite understand. And now my marginal comments. First of all, let me tell you, I want to give full marks to the uh, Egyptians for the deception uh, operation. Part of the deception operation resulted from the fact that about three or four months before the war, the a very important system uh, failed. I won't go into the details, but in many um, cases it's uh, similar to what's called the special sources. The difference is that uh, the difference between one of them to the moon and the other to the moon is not the same distance. After it uh, failed, um, the uh, 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 transmission security in Egypt went up by about 10 grades and the traffic in the special sources went down considerably. Yossi, excuse me, but you can't keep interrupting. And the last thing I want to mention, or penultimate maybe, is uh, the special uh, operations. Well, I don't think that this should be a public debate, but since it has become a public debate, let's, let's conclude. Well, I am concluding. There was one fellow called Duby. 
Duby was the one who operated the special sources. And he has probably seen all kinds of stories told about the special sources. And then he sent me his report, the one that he uh, wrote about, um, uh, the, about the sources that were being listened to. And he sent his report to Langotsky and to others. I'll, I'll, show, you in the, I'll show you in a minute. You're, I can show you that you are one of the addressees. I'll show you after this. What you're doing here is this information. People just don't understand. They say that Elizera told us interesting story, but this is... According to this document, I will soon find it. Well, we can't do it now because we have a, t a, t a timetable to keep to. I don't understand anything. Look... Can we can we finish this up? Well, Duby, Duby, don't forget Duby. Duby was the operator. He sent his report to me, and it says there that he operated the systems at um, quarter past one after midnight, and they were in operation until eleven o'clock in the morning on the on the Night, the night before, between Thursday and Friday. Yossi, I'm going to sit down with you and show you everything. Oh, you don't want that. Okay. The systems were on or open from quarter past one after midnight until Friday morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, for nine hours. And he tells her how it went from one place to another, one place to another, and didn't hear anything of importance, and that's why he shut it down. I don't know why he shut it down after nine hours. But if you, you, know, if you want to just uh, uh, examine things, that takes half an hour, not nine hours. Well, no questions. No, 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 we don't take questions. Thank you. You stopped me in the middle. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Major General Eli Zeira, who knew what he was up against and knew that there was high probability that all kinds of Langotskis would uh, uh, be uh, uh, lying in wait for him and still came here. 